Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is uh, your host Zubair Akram with part three of three uh, episode uh, with Sheikh Rizwan on this current crisis that we see in front of us, what some call genocide being televised live every day in front of us on our phones. Uh, what we covered in the first two episodes, uh, you know, we tried to make sense of why did Hamas do what they did. And we also looked at um, how Muslim populations, uh, communities across the West have responded. So that's what we kind of looked at. Uh, I don't see Muslim leaders, politicians saying much about it. If they are, there is no connection between the two, between what scholars are saying and there isn't connection between what politicians are saying. Yeah, so that's kind of introduction. I mean, we covered history as well. The second, I mean, the second session we did cover kind of background to the history as well. But I think you've encapsulated a number of things. It is kind of, I, I think there is a kind of sense. I'm mean, not amongst Muslims because there's, I mean, obviously they they be in some way biased, but not biased morally. But I think biased ethnically and religiously towards the Palestinians, obviously for, for very obvious reasons. But I think um, what's interesting for me is I've been, you know, the last two three weeks I've been listening to a lot of. Um, Zionist um, podcasts and um, speakers. I've been really wondering at uh, how they articulate what they're articulating. So it's always good to see an alternative. If you can see an alternative viewpoint, if there is a view viewpoint which is alternative, that ex is exactly it. I've also been listening to um, you know what I kind of refer to as self-hating Jews, people who are referred to as people um, that are Jewish of heritage of religion. But they criticize the state of Israel or the Zionist project. And they're trying to come to terms with the kind of moral shock of something which initially seemed to be an all out atrocity in the 7th of October. You know, um, Finkelstein, I, I watched him a couple of days ago, and he was saying that he was struck a couple of days into this whole event with the fact he didn't know morally where, where to stand because he, he said that it seemed to be carnage. It seemed to be indiscriminate killing of civilians in Israel. And he said he had this kind of moral fog. He was kind of generally, I think his kind of words were generally along those lines. And he said the only thing that made him think about it was what we call qiyas. You know, in Arabic Islam says you have qiyas, which is analogy. Is there anything analogous in human history that he knew of where an oppressed people were forced into doing something unspeakable, let's just say, quote unquote, unspeakable, if you accept you know, kind of middle, you know, middle of the road kind of understanding of what happened. I've spoken about what happened on October the seventh in the last two episodes, um, mm -hmm. but he said that went back to this, the the emancipation movement in in America, where you had a specific situation. I think Nat Turner, eighteen thirty something, um, where he he was a black um, leader who told his his congregation to kill every white person they could find, and they killed about 60 people. In other words, they killed and beheaded indiscriminately. And he said that was the closest thing he found to what is understood to be uh, you know, an abomination from an oppressed people, which then you had to look and see, well, what did the people who were, who were looking at this dispassionately, and the people that were ab abolitionists who were looking to abolish slavery, how did they view this? And he said, look, that gives you a very interesting insight, because what they did is they said, we told you so. This is going to happen at some point. Their, their initial thing was not condemning what happened. It was saying, what do you expect? And he said at that moment, he realized that the moral fog that he had wasn't moral fog. It, the reality was, and I said this very clearly, that in our religious faith, in our religious tradition, the ethics and legal tradition is one of condemnation. But the understanding of that ensuing from a people that are led to a collective Amnesia over what is violence is understandable. But in the West, there's been a lot of quiet voices, and I've noticed that, um, you know, and there's been a lot of people that I, I think um, have gone on another kind of crusade of, of sorts, which is just to, you know, play this kind of debating game, which I, I don't think it forwards the, the, the case of an oppressed people in any way. I think it, it just plays to the audience, it plays to your echo chamber where you're just putting out these messages to people that know this is exactly what they want to hear. But the role of scholars, and I believe the role of political leaders, is to say what is unpalatable and, and to stick to deep principles and not be swayed by 
the general word in the street or you know the the the, the push of our friends and families and 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 uh, associates who are who are saying one thing and just saying yeah exactly I, I agree exactly with what you're saying there has to be mm. some kind of um deliberation of over this because mm. it is not it is it's a clear simple issue from one perspective but it's not clear from another perspective because a lot of people say well it's such a clear issue it is in terms of where, who's oppressing but it's extremely difficult when you start to say, okay, the solution to it is extremely going to be extremely difficult. Sure. And this is why I think we're kind of duping ourselves into an elation over the hundreds of thousands of people marching on the streets, Indonesian, you know, yes. biggest um, support um, demonstrations in Muslim, majority Muslim countries. And very, very much like, um, you know, when was it? Um, 2003, wasn't it? Um, the Iraq demonstrations yeah, the Iraq. in February. I think it's winter. I remember it's really cold. Um, I went. I I came. I was studying in Syria, but I came to Glasgow because my mother phoned me up. I think something to do with the, the, the kitchen sink or something. And I came for like five, six days. It happened to coincide with the march on Iraq. I think hundred thousand people in, in Glasgow. It yeah. finished at the SECC. Um, I remember Osama Said. I think he gave a talk. I remember the, there was you know a lot of prominent Muslims speaking there. And yeah. in the sense of achieving something and then realizing, you know, a couple of weeks later, nothing's going to nothing's gonna happen. Um, that elation we have, I think it dampens the fact that this is going to be a very tough discussion after this all settles. The reality is that the, the, the unpacking of the solution is going to be extremely difficult. Now, you could say, well, it's not going to be difficult, Sheikh. Okay, good for you. I'm, I'm not interested in that way of looking at it because it's going to be in ex extremely the, difficult the, just because the, yeah. there is this timing there, there is an issue of timing you know mm. what needs to be said when um yeah. as well uh th th this mm. is not a new thing what's new is massacre uh, what's new is children getting killed indiscriminately um mm. and the whole population getting wiped out mm. uh whereas the solutions should have been mm. talked about well before this the, mm -hmm. and, and and the narrative should have been built for the ummah or you know the the, the Muslim community and for others uh, maybe ten years ago five years ago knowing but, but it's the, better, it's better. it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't I guarantee I I, I I followed this issue like many other issues there was no there was no um, look I was I was mentioning last week people just not um, attending volunteers meetings for the Palestinian issue up and down the country because they felt it wasn't an important thing. We, that that has not happened. So there's all these issues that they will have to be at, at least put on the on our radar in terms of the decisions we make now will 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 set us up for what happens after this this whole situation unfolds. At this moment in time, what you do is you have to do everything that we are doing, which is raising awareness, attending marches. We are lobbying our members of parliament, but the kind of you know, the impact of a, a, a policy document with specialists discussing it is far more important than, you know, dare I say, hundreds of thousands of people marching in in, in, in a city. But people yeah. don't know that because they don't know how politics works. They don't know how policy works. They don't know how lobby lobbying works. And therefore, they think that there's some kind of democratic system in place. And, and if you've not learned that there's no democratic system in the East or the West, you know, until now, then it's, it's not my problem. But th this is exactly what everybody comes to conclusion on. But we're still not saying that you don't do all those things that I've mentioned. But the reality is we have to have some kind of depth to our understanding. I think it was, again, Finkelstein, I remember he said, just to give you an idea of this, he met uh, Abdurrahman al-Rintisi. He, he was the intellectual head of Hamas. He was one of the founders of Hamas. And he said he met him, and he was he was discussing with him, you know, what's the end game? Like, what's how? What's success? And what he said is actually is worth just pondering over. He said during the first intifada, it, it was twenty to one. Do you know what twenty to one means? Twenty of ours dead for every one of theirs. He says the second intifada six to one. Now, now where is the end game? There is it one to one? Is it one to twenty? Is it hundreds to twenty? You know, is that how you decide whether you're going to be able to unlock this situation? From one perspective, they're absolutely right. But if you look at the figures now, you know, over four hundred, perhaps IDF Israeli soldiers killed, probably a couple of dozen, to be honest, in, in the offensives in, in Gaza. And this at this moment in time, based on the Israeli government's figures, 
look at the proportion now. Look at the number of civilians killed in relation to combatants. If you think of Palestinian combatants against civilians, it's about 100 to 1. And if that's a slaughter, that's a massacre, that's genocidal. That, that's not collateral damage. So it's all these things that are making Muslims, rightly so, extremely angry. And 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 the one the thing that has to be said is, and I've not said it up until now in any of the podcasts, but if 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 I've ever experienced an event which is going to spawn what they call quote unquote radicalization, this is the one. Because the narrative here is far more intense because of the, the blatant hypocrisy of politicians, the entrenched double speak of our, our of, um, leaders, and specifically of the West, which means, mm. you know, and the, and the social me media narrative and the media narrative and the governmental narrative, I think that's becoming, mm. you know, so, so clear. Now, the, the, there is this thing, um, what we, you said about social media. It seems that Palestinians uh, and the resistance movement, as they call themselves, have won the social media war. Uh, th there is this, um, th there is this constant coverage of, unfortunately, uh, their own getting killed every day. But there is coverage, and then there is BBC. You see um, CNN, Guardian, all the mainstream. Uh, electronic and otherwise, you, you see that there is there is a, a real tilt towards Palestinians uh, mm. in in the entire media. I don't know if you've noticed that, and if you have, no, no, I have. Your... I mean, at BBC BBC website, I go into the home page, and then you, there's a page on the Israel Gaza conflict. The first five stories are are you would say quote unquote pro Palestinian, not yeah. pro, not meaning you know um, saying Palestinians deserve, but essentially is the suffering of Palestinians. So there yeah. is this kind of narrative. I, I I don't always buy into it, but I know how it works in terms of mainstream media of pushing a specific agenda. But the facts, the fact, the numbers, the statistics, and this is pushed again by social media. This is pushed by what people see as a reality, which you've rightly pointed out that, you know, in, in, um, in terms of social media, it's quite interesting because Elon Musk, you know, for all his, you know, for some people, his feelings, he's opened up, and and I think change this narrative in a way that I don't see any anybody else, no Muslim social media expert, no commentator, nobody has done, which is this open up an avenue within social media where Twitter has, I, I believe, has has pushed um, narratives on other social media platforms such as Instagram specifically in a specific way because they have this whole um, concept of ratioing where you ratio, you know, pro and anti-Palestinian um, narratives on yeah. Twitter, for example. Muslim, the Palestinian narrative is far outstripping the Israeli narrative. It's unbelievable. Now, who's done yeah. that? Elon Musk opened up put Twitter. He purchased it, almost demolished it to oblivion through his you know, crazy madness. But the reality is he's allowed people who are thought leaders to be able to engage on Twitter, which has pushed quite um co quite complex ideas quite um kind of complex um theories out there into the public domain which has then meant that anybody within the public sphere whether they're interested in this issue or not are now affected and mm -hmm. what he I, I listened to one of his podcasts he was doing a podcast this week and he said you know the narrative is being lost by israel for one simple reason is that he said look just practically you kill one child in, in gaza mm -hmm. you've created a handful of you know, people who will become Hamas, you know, quote unquote, meaning even if you destroy the organization by the, I, I mentioned this first podcast, if I was in that situation, God help you if you think I'm not going to join some kind of organization like that, because you kill a child I know, and you expect me not to do anything, then you're in cloud cuckoo land. That's human right. nature. Right. And human nature has to be reined in by revelation, because at some point you have to be prophetic. You know, you have to be somebody who doesn't just become something that's who somebody who's vengeful. And this is what sure. I think is is the problem because we're in the ascendancy, and you understand, I understand, and the people that are listening understand this. This also will lead to, I believe, a degree of hubris. I mentioned hubris in terms of Arabic, Arabs, Arab leadership, in terms of why they keep losing war after war against Israel, because they have this sense of entitlement. The reality yeah. is that Israel has lost the narrative. Do you know how Israel would could have won, the, won this, you know, completely demolished any idea of any up Palestinian uprising is just by not doing anything on October the 8th. Sure. And just 
asking the UN, what do we do? Mm. And then mm. you know the, you know the whole reason that the whole reason that Israel exists is is based upon this narrative of, of the oppression on the Jewish people. Sure. And this would have been another hundred years of you know the Holocaust. This would be the because people were in you know, the Jewish community, the, well not sorry, not the Jewish community, the Zionist community have been talking about the fact that the, the effect of the Holocaust narrative is disappearing. It's in mainstream mm. news, it's everywhere. We need to rekindle this. People are forgetting. And the reality is, you know, David and Goliath, up until I would say 1967, when Israelis, you know, took over all this Arab land, up until then, it was clear to the, to everybody in the West who they thought David and Goliath were. You know, David was the Jewish nation under threat from all these Arabs. Since that time, slowly but surely, that's been dissipated. That's been disappearing, and now it's pretty mm. clear. I mean, anybody who's not in the on the paycheck of the, of, the, of the Zionist organization knows where David and Goliath splits. Who's mm. David? Who's Goliath? And the Achilles heel of of Israel is the narrative of oppression. If yeah. you listen to every single person who speaks about the Israeli position and defends the Israeli position, it's as if they're reading off a hymn book. The yeah. messaging is perfect, and I know a lot of Muslims say, "Well, you know, this person debated him and he won." He didn't, because the whole purpose of an Israeli spokesperson or a defender of Zionist actions coming on a news media outlet is to talk to the undecided, not to talk to their echo chamber. Mm, you know, when we yeah. speak, we're talking, thinking, "Oh, oh, Zainab's listening, and Ahmed's listening, going to clap me when I'm finished," and then, "Yeah, good for you," because these are the people that agree with what you're saying. You have to go for, you know, Dorothy, who doesn't know what to do. And so the calmness with which they present themselves, and this is actually a document um, called, called the Global Language Dictionary. It present, you know, it's, it's written up to present the the Israeli narrative. They review it every every so often, every five or six years. You know, it's it's it's, um, it's one of the initiatives of the Israeli project. It's kind of an organization, and it tells you how to answer every question, how to present yourself, how to show that the Palestinians have have usurped. Um, the democratic process, how they are not fit to be um, in, in 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 ownership of any land. You know all these things. They have, you know, set answers, and they also tell you how to present yourself psychologically to the audience. Now that's yeah. a key. Yeah. I mean, watching all these podcasts, all this um, stuff on social media and YouTube, what I've noticed is they're consistently going for the undecided and for mm -hmm. their own the people they need to have on their side. And mm -hmm. the truth of that, the, the proof of that is that all the politicians that they wanted on side are on side for them. Yeah. And the thing of anti Semitism, the definition of it and how it's going to affect the whole um, discourse from this point on. From, so there is anti Semitism that we've seen prior to October 7th. Do you, do you reckon that it's going to change somehow? So, no, the thing, thing for anti Semitism is. I actually put a, vi a video up on Isolabus um, YouTube channel on on a part of a course I did on Islam in the West, and I I was looking at an anti-Semitism as as a defined um, idea. Because the thing about anti-Semitism is, you know, the definition for anti-Semitism it started to have traction right when guess what the first Intifada was happening, and they realised that the narrative was slipping away. The narrative of an oppressed people was slipping away, so they had to define anti-Semitism. What is anti-Semitism? And so, you know, the European Union on Xenophobia and, and um, Racism set up a working group. They worked with with or Jewish organizations in, in America. Around, you know, five, six years later, they decided to give that to the Jewish community themselves to do. And at the end of it, in 2016, you had the IHRA International Holocaust um, Organization's definition, which is HR, AHRA definition, is the one that's now been accepted by most organizations, international organizations. Essentially, it's, it's a definition of, of anti-Semitism, which is was 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 written by Jew, by Zionists, not by Jews. You know, I keep making this Freudian slip by Zionists. And the reason why that's important is since when have you dis let the group themselves dis define what is illegal? Or what mm, is hate mm. speech? And you have all these working, you know, work examples of what it is. And you know where that where that came up program BBC in the morning. And there was the Israeli president, Isaac Herzog, 
he came on and the first, I mean, one of the first things he did, he pulled out a prop, pulled out a book. And it was the, it was Mein Kampf, you know, Hitler's Mein Kampf in mm. Arabic. Okay. So he's okay. saying, look, you know where this is going. And he's saying, look, we're, we're the oppressed people. Look at Hitler, what he did. Remember the British, remember we were fighting together. He's emotionally presenting it to the undecided. And he puts out this book in Arabic. My my struggle, Mein Kampf is my struggle in German. In Arabic. Mm. And he said, guess what? Guess where I found, guess where we found this? We found this on the body of one of the Hamas members in the kibbutz where we crowned him dead. This is the, the, the ideology of the Hamas, which is anti-Semitism. And you're thinking, well, mashallah, you've got a prop. This man's got a history of bringing out props, fabricated props, a lovely clean copy of Mein Kampf in Arabic. Now, the, the, the reason why anti-Semitism has to be on our radars is because the way that we will not be able to have our voices heard is through that one term, anti-Semitism. Because even liberal Zionists, they're saying, you know the word you, you started off with, with um, genocide. You said genocide. And you yeah. said eth ethnic cleansing and occupied, occupied. These are now considered by liberal Zionists to be examples of anti-Semitic tropes. In other words, you know, there's a whole history. 1945 was the first usage of the word genocide, specifically in the context of the extermination of Jews in Europe. Now, from that time, there's been a concerted effort on the part of the Zionist lobby to refuse to allow that word to be used for anything except what Jews, that, you know, mm. and, and there was any activity of violence against the Jewish community. Rwanda, in fact, one of my sheikh, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Sufi, Rahimahullah, I remember I sent a um, I sent a fax message. I was living with him in in Scotland, and he he sent a fax message to the. Organization of Islamic Conference, and we, we basically looking for a, a truce during the Bosnian War, and he used the word genocide. And what came back from the OI, you know, Organization mm -hmm. of Islamic Conference was, we're not allowed to use that um, term for Bosnians. Ah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I remember. And he was like, because he was curious. It's specific he said, to one community. Yeah, yeah, and he said, I remember it very clearly in his library. He said, "You know, one, this is this, this is what we're fighting against: the the the, the rape of language." This definition is specifically there to target pro-Palestinian, pro-Muslim voices. I mean, yeah. to, to the point, actually, so where I was reading this a couple of days ago. There was the Jewish um, voice, Voices for Labour. You know, the, the, the Labour Party has yeah. gone through a very, you know, you know, kind of, you know, unbelievable change. And this was actually related to, you know, there's this definition of Islamophobia. And... Um, yeah set up by the all-party parliamentary group. And I've spoken about this many times in the last two or three years. And now, I, I, I've been saying that it's a massive mistake. If you take on a definition of Islamophobia, you're buying into this victim mentality, which is the basis of the whole anti-Semitism trope movement, which stops Muslims and, and Palestinians speaking up against Zionist state. What they said, I was actually shocked because I didn't really, I didn't realize this initially. But when I went a couple of days ago, I looked at their um, website. So I'm going to read this to you. And they're talking about the Islamophobia definition, and they're saying, "Look, be careful, Muslims, because they're mm -hmm. pro-Palestinian." Okay, remember yeah. they're the pro-Palestinians, and they say, um, "Let's see, this they, they say it would be tragic if the adoption of the above examples, you know, the 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 definition of Islamophobia." leads to the suppression of free speech on, for example, Palestine and Kashmir and Islamophobia itself. Look, they picked yeah. up on something <laughs> that I've picked up on in so many people's WhatsApp and uh, social media messages is that you know, they're saying, we can't see this, we can't see this, we can't see this. So what are we supposed to do? You know, in America, half yeah. of the states in America um, will not give you social funds if you if you're part of a, a boycott scheme against the Zionist state. Yeah, and yeah. this is going to happen in the UK as well. Like um, you yes. know, public municipalities will not be able to have a policy where they boycott and di divest from Israeli companies. It, it's it, all, it's, it's on the basis lobbying. Yeah, it's, it's lobbying. on the basis of anti-Semitism. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so th this is where. The, their hard work is the hard work that they have done the, the community have done quite a bit of work to arrive where they have arrived and here we are uh the community giving your lives up 
not mm. knowing about the consequences and how or knowing about the consequences. But Sheikh, this is where uh, my, my next bit of the podcast is I'm going to focus on is that you have examples from Badr, from Tabuk, mm. from Hudaybiyah, uh, and like, like you know, three hundred people versus thousands, and then Tabuk as well, uh, where there is victory. Uh, there's Khaybar. So when you when you get these, and I've been listening to the, the some some of the leadership from from Palestine, from Gaza, uh, both uh, uh, military and political, and it is very clear that we don't care about how many lives are taken. We are actually representing the resistance. No matter what kind of community you are, we represent you if you have the mind to resist and to stand up for your rights. Life is nothing. Mm. Life doesn't matter. Mm. Where is scholarship here? What does Where do you see Muslim scholars giving a very clear guideline to Muslim minds where you need to stand? Well, I, I was... Look... Just to just wrap on the on Islamophobia thing, because that's really important. I mean, if you go into a battlefield and you realize when you get to the battlefield you don't have a weapon, um, that's why I think Muslims are going to realize when once this whole this whole settles down is that they've given up the ability to m make definitive contributions to the Palestinian cause because they won't have the weapon weaponry meaning the the the, the vehicle which is to to divest and to boycott. And to speak up clearly and confidently in, in a public discourse on these topics, because they've capitulated to um, accepting victim, to, um, you know, um, you know, kind of labels such as, you know, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. So I think it's really important. I think Muslim scholars, when I speak about it, the people just looking and thinking, "What was he talking about?" Well, the reality is, you know, we have to think a couple of steps ahead and realize when that discussion takes place, you have to be able to speak clearly and freely. But the reality is now everybody's not able to do that. This is the reality. I mean, if you're a public employee, you cannot speak up. And I've spoken to so many people in this. So I want to put that to the side. This issue of the religious context, like, look, human human life is not. I, there was something about how you framed that question, which I, I didn't fit right with me. The reality of the, the, the specific fit of fighting on a battlefield or even not on a battlefield, when you, you should leave the battlefield, in terms of proportions and 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 the numbers, in terms of proportionality, in terms of at what point you have to safeguard your existence, you know, the whole idea. You know, it was was it 1990 something, early 1990s. Albani gave an infamous fatwa uh, mm -hmm. during, I, I believe it was in the first intifada. It was just the end of the first intifada. We said, look, the Palestinians just need to do hijrah, which is complete stupidity from one perspective. Because his the reason why it was stupidity is because his logic was irrelevant. I mean, it was, was it made no sense. He said they couldn't practice a religion, which they could. Mm -hmm. And the second thing was even more preposterous is that he said they're not fighting under a, a, under a, a, an established transparent leadership. Mm -hmm. Again, so you have you know you know kind of interventions from you know quote unquote scholars here that don't make any sense. And I would include within that a lot of people I studied with in Damascus. Um, you know, during the, the second intifada, they gave fatwa after fatwa, and I believe under pressure from the governments under the under which they were living to mm. say, well, suicide bombing is perfectly okay. It's perfectly okay to kill non non combatants, uh, which was alien to the Sunni tradition. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, people say, well, no, we need to review that again because I think we can kill people. Um, I did a detailed study on this in the Islam's diploma course, um, and you know the people that were arguing for it. At, at, at that time, in the, in the early 20, 2000s, no longer argue for it. But I can see this being a reason why people say, "No, we need to, we need to um, use e every mean that we have at our at our disposal." Mm -hmm. Then you have Yusuf Qardawi, rahimahullah, you know, saying that you can't visit Quds because you have to boycott. And the moment that you come in with your passport, you're recognized as the state of Israel, and you're giving legitimacy to it. And again, I believe that was completely mistaken. Because mm. the moment you did that and you speak to Palestinians in, in Jeru East Jerusalem, you will say they will say, well, how are you going to find out about our plight? How are you going to find out this slow inc incursion of Zionists purchasing our land and making it impossible for us to survive if you don't come and see us? 
You know, mm. and so there was. A, but, I, that, I do but, believe but there's, scholars, an, but there's an implication, isn't it? If you don't start to build momentum, you can never build momentum. You got to start building some momentum, and momentum is that in Muslim populace, the entire Muslim uh, heartlands, there is a sentiment that Israel should not be accepted as a legitimate state. Um, okay. And if that sentiment no, no, that, that, leaves that's, that, that's, a, that's a sentiment, Zubair, that's a sentiment which is 1973, um, what, 50 years old. Yeah. Was it Khartoum, the conference, the Khartoum conference? They, they call it in Arabic, the Thalata La'at. The three no's. Yeah. Okay. You don't know about the three no's. This is no, 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 um, no peace, no recognition. No settlements, no negotiations. There's four, there's the three. But the point is, good for you. You've done it. You've said it, and that's been the position of the Arab nations in terms of yeah. political entities. I believe it was Libya, or it was either Khartoum or or um, Tripoli. I, I believe it was Khartoum. But the point is, yeah, you momentum. Yeah, you got it. Fifty years. So until when, you know, until when are you going to make the Palestinian peoples as a whole the sacrificial animal for your own political agenda? So I, I can't think of any situation in Muslim history where there's been this, this sense that we remain, either you kill us all or you let us be free. Now, that's Karbala. not to say, look. The, Karbala? No, no. The, the, no Karbala, the, the historical narratives in Karbala, Karbala are, are extremely, um, yes, it's another four podcasts for that. They're, they're compromised okay. for n numerous reasons. There's yeah. this sense of sacrifice for a higher purpose, but... That impetus is there. Zubair. I'm not saying the impetus is not there. That that heartfelt impetus is not there of feeling that you need to go above and beyond for a higher purpose. Absolutely. But the, sure. but the thing is, this is different. Look, if you don't understand it's different, I'm, I can't help anybody who think, doesn't think it's different. You have more ammunition descending upon Gaza than Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. This has been the most intense aerial bombardment in any urban population in human history. You know the episode of Dresden in the Second World War? It's a drop in the ocean compared to what's, just, what's happening at this moment in time. Now, if you think that you're going to just say we can sacrifice without any understanding of um, human life, I, I, I believe that's religiously, religiously wrong without having to think about it. The Israeli Zionist state cannot win this battle because... You know, in interna international um, conflict theory, they have this idea that the way that you understand whether somebody's won a, a war is based upon their their outcomes. What what have mm -hmm. they said they want to achieve from this? <coughs> the moment that the, Israel said that they want to abolish, you know, demolish Hamas, it was clear that nobody, nobody, and nobody who heard that would, would say that they can achieve that because it's impossible. Because regardless of how many people are dead, there will be Hamas leadership saying that we're still, you know, in Qatar or wherever they are, and they will mm -hmm. say, well, we're still here and we're ready for a next, next round. And Israel comes out that defeated and rightly so. So there, there is, in the moment, the need to put that message out, which is that this, and this is why the first episode we did was so important, which is this idea of shahada, which is that that's, that, is, that is registered in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it doesn't mean that then that becomes the, the the headline of how you engage with it in a religious context. Because, you know, at some point you have to bring in the ability of the human mind and revelation to understand and to dissect this. And, and, and that's where I think we're going to have a lot of difficulties because, you know, one of the things, I, you know, I believe that is stopping... Um, that is the Zionist state from disintegrating is the fact that you know young people specifically in 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 Israel they believe that if we were to get rid of Zionism there would be consequences and revenge from the Palestinians very much like if you think of South Africa very very similar the whites in South Africa did not relinquish control of South Africa even when they knew it was the thing to do and the right thing to do and and the best thing for them to do because they feared the consequences and do you know how that was sorted out it was sorted out by Mandela, who, I mean, this is a master stroke, and I, I, I believe I've spoken to this about this before, almost prophetic in character. Yeah, yeah. Where he, yeah. he basically managed to do something nobody else could do, which is he alleviated that fear 
and and this transition was so smooth. If you think, if you look back in history, yeah, people say, "How yeah. did you do that?" And how he did that is the way the Prophet ﷺ conquested Mecca, because when Mecca was about to be conquered, I remember there was um, who was it? Saad, Saad ibn Ubadah radiyallahu and I think the leader of the Bani Khazraj. He was one of the the, the flag bearers on the day that they were going into Mecca to conquest it. And he said, and it came back to the Prophet. He said, today is the, the day of war and bloodshed. Today is the day in which the the hurma, the, the, the sanctity of, of Mecca will be alleviated. In other words, we will suspend it for a day and kill as many people. When the Prophet heard that, he demoted him. And this is Sa'ad, oh. radiyallahu anh, one of the, the most important leaders in Madinat Nawara. He demoted him. And he was Sa'ad was the one, I remember, who was going to be put forward by the Ansar to be the Khalif after the death of the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet demoted him and if he hadn't demoted him the peace that we saw in the conquest of Mecca would not have happened because the fear of the Quraysh was what? That they will be slaughtered in revenge by the Muslims which meant that they were going to, re be, going to be ready to put up a fight. And that fear among Zionists is the reason why the Zionist state, state is going to continue to exist. Because the young mm -hmm. people who were essentially not interested in the Zionist project. They're more interested in, you know, one of the international capitals of, of, of LGBT is um, Tel Aviv. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a society that's going down, the, you know, going down the pan by itself. But what's bringing it together is this sense, well, we need to, you know, hold out because if we don't, then we're going to be slaughtered. And I think mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing that we need to understand that our, our narrative has effects and it, and it, and there's there's for me definitely there's a sense that the profession. So, so uh, what, what's is, the narrative? What's the, what what is the narrative at the moment in, in your view? What what is the narrative uh, amongst Muslims? Look, I don't care about the narrative amongst Muslims. I don't. I mean, to be honest, the reason, reason I'm saying that is if I listen to the narrative amongst Muslims and try and copy it or speak to it, then I'm not doing my job. I mean, not doing what I feel I, you know, I should be doing, which is blind spots. Because this podcast, the point is not to get a large readership; is is to get point at blind spots for people that are in some kind of situation where they have influence, and they can listen to it and say, "Well, there's these blind spots I I have." What I'm hearing is that there is a situation that exists, and there is a solution that has been proposed. Or there is no solution that's been proposed. Basically, we don't see anyone talking about how this whole thing can end into something which is um, desirable. Desirable thing mm. is people living in peace and with sanctity of life. See, that's if that's desirable, desirable, I hope, hopefully, inshallah, that's what people want to desire. This is what I'm missing because. Amongst people I'm speaking to, there's lots of people who are saying, well, that's not what we want, what we want. It's the thalatha, it's the three nose of Khartoum. It's still that. I mean, it's as no, if... The, 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 every, every, conflict, every conflict the Prophet ﷺ, uh, was involved in uh, is to end into Amanahum bin Khawf. I believe that absolutely. And, and you believe that absolutely. But I believe... The the hubris. I mean, I, people what you mean hubris. This kind of confidence in your situation, just because you've got the upper hand in social media, for example, doesn't mean geopolitically, economically, in terms of how the world actually works. It's not going to change just because you have much more traction in social media. That is going to remain as it is, and that's the unfortunate reality. Um, mm. You know, I mean, you know that I know that everybody should know that they don't know it, but the reality is that the geopolitical I, situation I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm is feeling much more important. Podcast. I'm feeling this podcast may attract criticism uh, mm -hmm. of uh, this is like three years too early. It's five mm -hmm. years too early or it's it's mm -hmm. a few weeks too early because people are dying. People are giving mm -hmm. their lives and we're talking about, oh, are you doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. No, so we're saying we're doing the right thing. There's things about on our, our, uh, on our radar has to be um, a, a road you know, you have to know, even in the midst of a battle, you have to know the road out. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean we're thinking, okay, three years down the line. The reality is, you know, like Einstein said, you know, people who forget their history are, are bound to mis repeat its mistakes. The reality here is that the here and now I covered in the first, um, the first podcast, the history of it, you could say, well, what's the point of talking about history when people are dying? 
but that's not how the world works. So you have to you have to engage your mind at some point. And what we have to do is the here and now is to get the narrative right. So what I'm saying is if you're if you're co-opting this idea of victimhood, and then that that same concept of victimhood is a thing that's stopping you saying what you believe is right, then you've 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 lost the battle when the battle is taking place. That's my point. See that that's mm. not saying this. This is not something three years away. This is today, and at this yeah, moment what, in time, what, what did Nuruddin Zengi do? Nuruddin Zengi, well, if you want to know what he did, he 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 did the most un un incorrect thing, which is to sort out. I mean, this is you would say, well, this is Sheikh, you're going off topic because you started it. Nuruddin Zengi started sorting out all the Muslim di di um, disputes and all the internal frictions that they had. And he established hundreds, and Nordin Zengi established hundreds of madrasas. You could say, well, what's the point of establishing madrasas if you're, um, you know, you've, you're, you're supposed to be conquering um, Quds? He didn't. He established madrasas, um, religious institutions, study, studying Sharia. You could say, well, this is a quietest, um, you know, bloodthirsty warlord. He wasn't. He was a, one of the awliya. He sorted out the Fatimids first. And then again, solidified and, and, and consolidated the Muslims. And then he went, you know, with complete confidence. I mean, so the point, the detail is, the Evelyn is in the detail historically as well. You can't just say, Nordin Zengi, what did you do? That's what he did. He did, you know, the, you can go into the details, but that's what he did. Meaning, he realized that there were steps to be taken to realize something that would have some kind of lasting impact. It's not forever, but has some lasting impact. And that's why I think our thinking people have to be on the demonstrations, writing to their MPs, boycotting. They have to be doing all those things and they have to be thinking. The thinking ones have to be thinking, okay, what's the end game? Because based on the end game, you're, you're taking the next step. Like if you're going, so if you. End, end game, I what I would like to see this, this nation called Palestinian nation, they got mm -hmm. betrayed by their own leadership. Mm -hmm. They got sold. By, by which uh, so, leadership? Um, Ottomans. So this is, okay, so the Ottomans the, betrayed them. The, the Ottomans betrayed them by not standing for them, and they let the Arabs to sell them. And they started selling land at a higher price. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they sold waqf lands. Which they, who, they, they, who, they, who's, who sold waqf land? <laughs> you, have be, you have to be clear on who, who's doing what. Palestinians living in the, the in Okaf, the, the Bakf area, they sold lands uh -huh. for, for a higher price at that at that time, uh, because there was an infight between Turks and Arabs. You know something interesting, Al Haj Amin Hussein, he was the famous he was during the second, you know, first uh, first world war, uh, second during the second world war, more specifically 1930s, siding with, you know, the kind of the Germans. And Hitler, you would say, and considered to be some kind of fighter for Palestinian rights. But he was he was at the helm when they were selling Waqf land to Awqaf land or, or, or Kharaj land to, to Zionists as well. You know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. you know, he sold a massive plot in the middle of Jerusalem to, I believe, it was the English um, athletic athletics, some English athletic association in the middle of Jerusalem, which is Waqf land. And he signed it off. So. There's all this very, very difficult history that we have to understand. And you could you could say, well, Sheikh, it's not the time to discuss all these details. But the point, this is not for, you know, there's plenty of people doing great work of sound biting um, elsewhere. So, I mean, the point is we can't live in this kind of, um, you know, kind of made up narrative in our minds where everything is amazing amongst our, ourselves. And, you know, the solution to this issue is simple and straightforward. It's not. Um, mm. The sim simple and straightforward thing at this moment is that there's at this point in time gen genocide taking place, one-sided, sure. um, and the people who are being fought need our immediate support. And everything you can do and every moment that you have has to be expended in that as much as you you believe in that that cause. And also within that is the fact that when this all settles down, everyone will go back to every exactly where they were before. I know this. I've been through this situation. In numerous conflicts, so many times. Look at the Rohingya situation. You know that was a that that is a genocide. Um, you know, and people for about three or four weeks were, you know, really emotionally involved in that and disappeared off our radars. 
completely. I mean, it's not, not non-existent. Um, and so this will happen with the Palestinian issue as well. And people always say, well, is this different this time? There's like 20-year-old people telling me, oh, this is so different than, what have you experienced in the past? Like the first intifada, second intifada, you know, you know yourself, myself, we experienced it as young, young you know, the yeah. first intifada was in my late teens and second intifada, the Iraq war. So these big events have taken place and everybody at the home and they're living it says this is so different because this is the turning point of the ummah. Well, you know, my memory is, I keep my memory fresh. Because the people that didn't turn up for the, you know, the stalls in Glasgow for the Palestinian cause before this conflict took place, are the same ones, you know, alhamdulillah, are now back, and realizing that that mistake. But the reality is, um, the human being is created, as the Quran says, in a state of loss. I completely forget what's happening. This is why, so, you know, what, what, what's the solution? Solution. Uh, what, what I'm hearing from you is, what what. What I hear from you is solution presented to us is not really a solution because there is no solution presented. The, at, at the moment, it is fight, boycott, give your lives and shout that there is massacre that's taking place. And massacre mm -hmm. keeps increasing in, in its volume. Mm -hmm. And Muslim leadership, both political and religious, have failed to come to consensus on what the solution in this kind of situation is? Yes, so look, Zabar, the solution, that solution is not, it's different from what we, the obligation. So only obligation is now, there's obligation, which is sure. raising awareness, demonstrating every single civic action you can do has to be done, which is your obligation. It's not a solution issue. The solution issue is for thinking people. So this is not podcast for people that are, doing the obligation. This is for the people that are thinking, okay, when the d dust settles and we take stock of what's happening, what what is our, what is the solution-based analysis of what's happening here? Because there's lots what of people would, who say... What, what, as a call, what would the success look like? Well, I mean, it depends. I mean, it's not for me. This is where I would say it's not for me because I'm not mm -hmm. Palestinian. And you can say, well, Sheikh, you're a Muslim, so Al-Quds... Yes, but this is a strategic issue which the Palestinians... This is why I said when I when it was a religious, ethical issue, I have a right to make my analysis of that. In terms of solution, if the, if the, if the Palestinians um, see a two-state two situation being plausible, that's up to them. I don't see... It be, in, the, in the current situation, it's impossible. Um, but that's my opinion is as good as anybody else's on that. That's an issue of analysis. Normalization. I mean, you know the Arabs. Arab. There was an Arab initiative. I don't know if you know. Two thousand and two. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and essentially, you probably don't know about it because the same day Hamas, you know, blew up. I don't know how many people in northern Israel in a suicide attack to make sure it didn't work because it was the Arab. All the Arab nations for the first time agreed in some kind of um, land for peace, which is the basis of the post-1967 situation, um, you know, um, resolution 242 in the UN, looking to, you know, provide safety and security for the Palestinians in, in, in exchange for the land that, that has been occupied from them. You know, that that has been resurrected in, the, in what you know now is a normalization project. Um, you know, Jordan has obviously, obviously been part of that, but Morocco, Mauritania, um, Bahrain, UAE, all those countries have come under a lot of criticism for that. And rightly so, from uh, from a specific perspective, and, and Saudi Arabia, obviously the most important, um, on the on the on the cusp of doing that before this attack. Now it's for the Palestinians to decide, and I believe that the Palestinians will have a difficult time accepting that Saudi Arabia, for example, is going to speak on their behalf on this after this situation. Oh. Um, but the the reality is, um, the normalization project has some kind of leverage. Because until you get Israel to, you know, be an entity that is taken taken to task for its its actions by people that have connections with it, from one perspective, you could say, well, there's no other option for a, 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 a Jewish Zionist state to exist here, unless you do normalize in some way. But obviously, yeah. this, that is not on the on the table at this moment in time because of the fact that these are 
this is an entity that is taking part in a strategized genocide. Its strategy is to remove the trace of these people from that land. So how can you think of you know, a process of normalization? But I think some things we have to be careful, we, we have to have our eye on, is you know, external support for the state. And this is where everything is so finely balanced. You know, in America, um, mm -hmm. the the next elections next year. The you know, I I looked at I read some analysis a couple of weeks ago, where it was it was saying that, you know, out of the the American state, there's only four that are undecided. So every other state in America, fifty or so states have decided who they're going to vote for. So in other words, we know exactly where the election is going to go in that perspective. But there's about four that have not decided. You know, amongst them is Pennsylvania, famously in Georgia. But amongst those, you can hone it into the specific places where you know the swing vote is. And it's like 100,000 in four states. Look, there were four states in America. 100,000 people are going to essentially decide the next election in America. Yeah. That's and they can hone it further. Look, you can hone it further. You can hone it to not the urban population of the 100,000, split it to 50,000 urban and 50,000 rural, rural. It's the 50,000 rural population of those four states that will decide the next American election. Now, that next American election will decide whether America remains as it is under Biden, an America that has this sense of entitlement to police the world, or it will be one which will say, sorry, guys, we're out. We're out of here, which is Trump. Isolationism. In other words, Israel is fantastic knowing you, but we're off. And, well, that tells you something. If you're going to think about the Palestinian issue is, well, why shouldn't Muslims vote for Trump? Because he's going to, you know, present the deal of the century. The whole purpose of the deal of the century for, for the Middle East is not to bring peace to the Middle East. It's to get America out of the Middle East. And so from one perspective, it makes if you were a strategist advising a, a Khalifa, you would say, well, I think we should put some kind of AI technology behind Trump to win the next election. That's how fine it is. And also you would look at the, you know, the, the world at large and you would say, well, the kind of the South-North bloc, the kind of American-European bloc on the one hand and the, the Chinese-Russian bloc on the other, to really have it so there's not such a symmetry in terms of economic power. You know, there's Turkey, there's probably Indonesia, there's um, Saudi Arabia, I'd put in that as well. Mm -hmm. Those those three, and even India, for example, those four states, three or four states, are pivotal in deciding which of those blocks has power in terms of international um, leverage. Because UN is irrelevant in terms of power politics. You know, BRICS is you know arrival to Amer the American UA um, European Union's um, co coalition. And so, if, if Turkey had slipped and flipped in the last election, where it became mm -hmm. very clearly in the camp of America and Indonesia remains clear, closely allied with America, for example, then the Americans would be much more emboldened. And Saudi Arabia is, is you know, did they not just like sign a normalization project with, with Iran under the auspices of guess who? China. Oh. And so everything is finely balanced, which means the whole, the whole discussions about UN resolution, this and that, you could essentially put it in the bin now because it's irrelevant. The power sure. politics will be that, that the new kind of, Poles of influence will be such that they will dictate where the peace um, process will go. Not, you know, this resolution, that resolution, 1967. No one cares about that anymore. This is a completely new situation. You add into that the economic, you know, energy, you know, you know, it was September this month, this year actually, where the, the G20 discussed this um, India, Middle Eastern. Um, economic energy corridor from you know linking india saudi arabia through israel all the way up into europe and so they want stability and if that means that the zionist state is not providing stability in some way you could say well they're going to insist that the zionist project comes to an end because it's all about wealth you know so hmm. i think we have to think look that what 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 was possible in the past is not possible you know, in the 1970s, you could turn off the oil. And a lot of Muslims I've heard say, look, turn off the oil and, you know, Europe and America will come crashing. It's not the case. I mean, America exports oil. It exports yeah. gas. They, they, you know, King Faisal, rahimahullah, when he did what he did, he did it at a point where 
none of these countries were self-sufficient. It would sure. affect Europe, but it would affect China, it would affect Sudan, it would affect um, Syria, it would affect all these countries. Inflation would go crazy, Muslims would be rioting in the streets. It's not going to have the same effect now. That was the 70s. So a lot of people are living in, in, in a world where the UN, UN is where we discuss international issues, where you know finance and economics is what you know runs the world. The reality is Israel is a very strong economy. It has it performs all the Middle East in terms of you know GDP, in terms of well, sorry, the Europe in terms of GDP, which means that it's not as fragile as we deem to think. It's in their interest to normalize. Once they normalize, I think the whole raison d'etre, the whole justification for Israel existing will start to dis disappear. And this is where I think for Muslims in the West, I just want to finish off, I'll we'll probably finish off our discussion with this, is for Muslims in the West, this has been a wake-up call in a way I think we discussed in, Ram in Ramadan, you know, this LGBT issue, when I was saying, look, Muslims, they react and they get angry and then they do certain things. And then they realize, and I said, they will realize later that they've not thought about this properly. And the, the issue I made was, you know, alliances and, and politics and how, how it works is much more complicated than saying, I don't like this, I'm sorry, we're going to boycott or something. You know, because what's happening now is, I, I, there, was a, there was a march in Glasgow, in the oh. University of Gamsa, and Glasgow University Students Association, Muslim Students Association, somebody emailed me and they said, Sheikh, it was at this demonstration. We did a, they had a sit in in Barry's Road, in the middle of Barry's Road. And, yeah. and he said, one of the things that, that shook me slightly was the fact that we were, we were outnumbered in, in that with, you know, left leaning people, a lot of whom had LGBT paraphernalia on. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that, you know, when, when Muslim scholars in America, I, I believe wrongly, but they did, they sided with the, the liberal left wing is because they sort of stood up for civil rights. And in the Palestinian issue, it's very clear that it's the left that is supporting our um, push towards a ceasefire, towards standing up for Palestinian rights. And if you go to the marches, you will see exactly that. Because I just watched something on Sky News, and there was a Muslim Palestinian scarf, big beard. And they were saying, you know, it's great here because we've got, you know, we've got um, people from LGBT, we've got Muslims, we've got, the, you know, <laughs> we've got Jews. So... All of, all of a sudden, where, where's that whole thing about a month, two, three, four, five months ago where people were going crazy about the LGBT issue? Mm. They should have got into perspective and they should have been more principled because I was saying at that point the same thing I'm saying now, which is in the midst of this madness, you will make decisions that will show that you're naive in the way that it pans out in the future. And this is exactly what's happening. And so now you're going to have to say, oh, all these people are, you know, marching. You know, there's actually a group called Gaz uh, Gays for Gaza. Mm, you know, mm. and you know there was a there was a podcast. Douglas Murray, famous in xenophobic, um, how can I use race racist? Yeah, Allahu Akbar. I can't describe him, but he 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 was like on a podcast, and and the 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 host said, "Well, what do you think of these gays for Gaza?" And he said, "Well, the latest news is that there's not enough tall buildings in Gaza to throw them off." So obviously, <laughs> do you understand? Like yeah. he's picked up on the irony in a way that you know not many people can, but the reality is some of the the most articulate, one of the best, um, most um, you know precisely articulated um, dem demolitions of the Zionist project is by Judith Butler. Judith Butler is a famous famous academic from Berkeley University who has been pushing this idea academically of transgenderism <coughs> of queer. The queer, the queerness of gender and sexuality. She's at the forefront of, by herself, single-handedly mainstreaming the LGBT narrative in academia, but also in government. She's the one. She's got the best um, critique of the Zionist project. She's got a book called Parting Ways: Jewishness huh. and the Critique of Zionism. So there you go, guys. There's your, there's the best demolition of the Zionist project. And guess who it is? It's the person that you consider, what you consider to be. What are you going to do? Where's the where's the nuance? Where's the where's the foresight? It's disappeared. It's not there. And so all of a sudden, the reason why you always say, "Look, Sheikh, it's not the time to speak." But the reason, the reality is, this is not for everybody. This is for thinking people. You have to think. How do you navigate that? 
How do you navigate it? You're in the West. You have to build up some kind of alliances. What do you do? Because the people that are ranting in, in, in podcasts are the same people are ranting against the LGBT or saying Muslim you know, politicians have sold out what and X, X, Y, and Z. What we're saying What's is contest yeah, well, so, well, solution, what, what I hear is that context has changed, situation has changed, institutions that mattered don't matter anymore. Uh, power politics has changed. And what's not changed is Muslim mindset providing some narrative. It's so, it's so, it, it, the Muslim mindset is so immediately um, entangled in what is happening without thinking about, about anything, a step, even one step forward. You know, yeah. when this all settles again, when it's all settles, they're going to have to think of how did we view, how did, why did we have nuance and and a, a degree of thought in our understanding of how we deal with this issue, which is important for us? Because I spoke to, spoke to the LGBT issue, you know, five, six years ago in detail. I've done courses for a decade on this. I've been speaking about warning people about this issue. They're not not caring. But I did it in a way that was nuanced, which which was talking about the fact you have to have a principled approach to this. And Palestine is the same thing. You have to have a principled approach to it. You can't have an emotionally emotive appro approach to it. And that means that, you know, one eye has to be in the future. One eye has to be in your blind spots. One eye has to be on the difficult conversations in the community. And don't tell me you're too busy doing other things. Because that doesn't mm. take any mind. It doesn't take any time. You just need to know, oh, I need to be a bit more careful in how I just jump onto sensational demagoguery of, ranting about an issue without understanding its, its, its deeper impl implications. And that's why, you know, we can probably wrap up with, you know, what we need to do. Because I said, you know, you were saying, Sheikh, you know, um, solutions. It's not time to speak about solutions. I said solutions and obligations are two different things we need to do set yep. at the same yep. time. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah. Obligations are what you do now. Solutions is something you need to, okay, work upon for the next time. Like, I'll give you an example. You're about to pray and you're locked in a room. You shouldn't be praying. It's najasa everywhere. Your obligation is still to pray. The solution mm. will be okay when I get out of this, this um, situation. I should not be in. What's the solution next time? That's the difference between mm. a solution and an, an obligation. If you don't understand that, it's my problem. I mean, the reality is that's how the world works. That's how fiqh works. That's how religious tradition works. We didn't build this religious tradition up over centuries for it just to be ignored. And so you know, the next thing would be obligations. You know, you know, inshallah, people should look at the obligations that we have and 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 think what are they? You know, that's probably the most important thing. And still, so kind of have a conversation about what the possible solutions are. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Look, if I was say, look, what do we need to do? I would yeah. put education right at the top of that. Now, if you if 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 you come and speak to a Zionist on the topic of 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 Palestine and Israel, you'll be demolished on the history of it and the law and the legal <laughs> legal aspects of it and probably religious aspects of it. I'll tell you that unless you are you you have educated yourself on this. Hmm. Okay, that's the first thing. So if you're not interested in reading, educating that, you can ignore that. No, it's not everybody, but if you're invested in this topic, you need to you know read some really important people. You know, Ilan Pape, I mentioned this previously, historically is an amazing voice. Um, but also the second thing is, I think we have to organize ourselves to be much more clever in our interventions. Law, I've always said law is such an important area of intervention because it's essentially mm. the one that enforces your viewpoint on other people when you have a legal basis upon which to act. The fact that you've got arms leaving the UK for Israel when Israel is is in clear breach of arms treaty obligations means that there should be nothing leaving UK. In other words, we should be organized as a Muslim community to provide legal insights for people who are who are taking an, an active, you know, hands-on approach to disrupting the, the sale of arms. We should be supporting them through our legal expertise as a Muslim community. You know, that's an that's a no no non-brainer to me. Legally, law is essentially in this in our context is is the greatest jihad. You wow. know, having, you know, somebody asked me like a couple of years ago on a podcast, you know, Sheikh, what should we do to benefit the Ummah? I said, become a human rights lawyer. Mm -hmm. Do it, just do it, because you will leverage much more and affect more, more people's lives than I'll ever be able to affect. And people mm -hmm. just think, oh, it's just, just making, it absolutely does. It's leverage is important. 
But also, you know, people have been sharing information. But I would say, look, share intelligent information. Sh share information that is affecting the undecided, not the echo, echo chamber that you have. I, I think we would need to have one more episode on solutions. Well, look, the solutions are people, alhamdulillah, they're doing great, great on this. I mean, people, remember solution, well, solutions, ob are you talking about obligations or solutions? No, I'm talking about solutions. I'm not talking about obligations. Obligations we've spoken about. But there is mm. this solution. No, no, I've not finished the obligations. Obligations are now, this moment in time, that issue of like sharing, even the strategic engagement with, I mean, the one. I think one of the most, if you're a Muslim scholar listening to this, you should disengage with interfaith work completely. Interfaith work is essentially a skeleton which normalizes into our civic infrastructure as, as a community groups that have the worst interest of Muslims at heart. Zionist, pro-Zionist organizations that that embed themselves in these civic structures are, 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 are it means that we have to disengage with interfaith completely. So if, you know, from two thousand nine, I've not taken part. I've not taken part in any interfaith activity at all under the under the under the umbrella of interfaith. In fact, in our mm. isyllabus offices above us is Scottish inter, interfaith offices. I met sure. them because they knew me from like two thousand eight nine, and they said, "Well, we should get back together and do some work." And I and I said, "I'm so I, I'll apologize politely, but I'm not going to do that." And I explained to them why. Because it's it's yeah. a front. It's a front to normalize, um, especially specifically Zionist, but also Hindu nationalist um, voices, and to get us yeah. to sit and humiliate ourselves by sitting at the same table. It's not just for this period of conflict. This should be a complete, um, a blanket. And what we should do instead is to have bilateral interfaith work and initiatives with specific religious communities that we know are working on the basis of faith. And that's why I do. I've done work with the Church of Scotland. I've done, I did a, 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 a massive document on, on um, ethical finance with the Church of Scotland, because I knew this is what we're doing, and we, we're we're on the same, you know, you know, on the on the same table in terms of what we're talking about. And also, sure. we should kind of create. I mean, I mean, Muslim activists should try and create um, anti-Zionist forums with Jewish representatives and and bring them into the bring them into the discourse that we have. Because it's important that we don't become isolated in terms of our narrative. We need Jewish voices within our our fight against the Zionist state. And I think the most important one, and I think the most controversial one for most people, is we have to disengage with this whole narrative of Islamophobia and victimhood. Mm. The whole mm. idea of victimhood and Islamophobia, and the definition of Islamophobia, and using it to push for your rights, is essentially the same. The other side of the same coin which the Zionists use to pro prop up the Zionist state and allow it to survive. And push it all, strip it all back to the Equalities Act, you know, strip it all back to legal protections that we have, because the moment that you, you accept victimhood, you have essentially played, play, been played by the Zionist lobby by making the biggest mistake and the biggest coup for Zionism, which is to put them at the pinnacle, the highest level of, 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 of the oppressed people. Under that, put other minorities and put Muslims and Palestinians right to the bottom. We are not mm. playing that game. We we should not, cannot, and have no need to play that game, because you're mm. talking about mm. Gaza. You then you talk about Badr and the Battle of of Tabuk and the and the and the honor that we had as a community. And I just feel it's so embarrassing that we grovel now on. Oh, that was so Islam Islamophobic. Yeah, and uh, uh, that's the mentality of a victim. That's the mentality of a person who's defeated. I refuse to be part of that. And I've said this many times. The reason why I refuse is not just because I, we, we should refuse to become victims, is because more importantly, that idea of victimhood was created to buttress up a very specific state in the Middle East, which is a Zionist state. And mm -hmm. if you're okay with that, you're okay with this whole Islamophobia thing, that's up to you. But, you know, mm -hmm. you know I'm out of that. That's the obligation. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a rather extended podcast uh, inshallah we'll bring you more um, on the similar theme um, for, this is three of three Sheikh, anything in pipeline for, for the audience well I mean it depends on 
neat, doesn't it? Missing audience is a small audience, so I focus on in individual contact and in, um, communication. Because the thing is, so much there's so much information, there's so much um, content out there on Palestine. Um, you know, as you say, on obligations, I would say at that level. But I just see the fact that, you know, the big, I always think of the bigger picture. If no one's looking at the bigger picture, I say, look, I need to look at the bigger picture. I've spoken to at least two, I can remember, two councillors in the UK who are leaving politics because of the whole backlash they've had over, you know, it's so difficult to be an um, elected member because there's hmm. so many people slandering you and attacking you on social media. You know, we have to think, we're hounding Muslim members of parliament out of politics. And, I, you know, did we not just like have this whole thing about we need more people in public office? Yeah. You have to realize the complex, remember we had this Hamza Yusuf controversy. I did yeah. mention that the, the there's a whole narrative to the political engagement, which we've all of a sudden decided to forget. We've got this collective amnesia. Now, the fact that you've just woken up at this moment in time does not absolve you of the fact that this is a very, this, the, the, the whole issue of representative politics requires certain ways of buying into collective messaging of a political party. Now, if you don't do that, then you know what you do? You do, I don't know if you remember um, the Islamic Party of Britain. Do you remember? Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do, yeah. You, you Must, remember? Uh... Sahir Mustaqim Blair, was it? Yeah. That's it. There you go, Blair. Yeah, absolutely. Do you want... Yeah. Okay, guys, okay, you're, you're Muslim. The people that are disenchanted with the political parties, there's your straight from the blast from the past. That's We had that before. You can create that again. Um, who else was it? You know, in, in the in the wake of the Iraq war, was it not Salma Yaqub from Birmingham? Yeah, she, she, was it she was part she, it's not Salma Yaqub. She was part of that. Respect. Part of the respect, yeah. Respect, yeah. So, respect, respect. I mean, the whole thing of what happens when you get engaged at that level, you burn out, and yeah. that is the reality of the demands that the, the lay Muslim who wakes up every couple of years on a topic has on on owning on owning politics and politicians when they feel like it, and not realizing the grind that takes to get into that kind of position in the first place. No one wants to yeah. say. No one wants to speak about that. Everyone wants to say, you know. Boycott this and call for ceasefire. That, but the reality is, you have to, you should have you should have the common decency of understanding what kind of what goes into creating a political discourse, the political system. You know, and and if you want to improve it, then improve it. The whole purpose is, we can't just keep going back and creating all these situations where we 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 react to certain situations and then, you know, the next situation comes up. And I've lost count of how many times this happens. We're always saying this is different. This is a. a you Do you know, know what, a, what I'm hearing from you just now? Moment. I, I I don't know if it is. Yeah, it requires humility. But let me throw that out for a bit. Not many people will understand what you're saying. What you what I'm hearing from you is that having the maturity of understanding the the the, the situation and also having the maturity of letting people do what they're doing, even if, in your view, is partially correct. But it's not even that. It's, it's, it's not understanding the complexity of what you've said is what it takes to get to a point where they've taken, you know, they've got to, being a councillor, being a member of parliament. And mm. we become victims of propaganda almost. And mm. I, I go back to scholars um, and leaders who've not given the correct parameters of discourse, I would say. Hmm. They, they, hmm. You know, they, there are masjid groups I'm part of, like WhatsApp groups, and every day you get posts uh, about list of Muslim parliamentarians, uh, how bad they are because now let's see how they're going to vote for ceasefire or not. And if mm. they do, boycott them. I look, p people in those groups have the right to boycott. I mean, but the thing is, they have to ask themselves to what degree are they engaged in the process to feel happy to do that. You know, sure. The Prophet Ali Salat, you know, there's this concept, the Prophet taught, saying that Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, the, this concept of connections. This is what something, every companion took something specific from Prophet Salat. I believe saying Muawiyah, took this concept of keeping a connection with somebody even if you never knew you would need the connection. 
it's in Arabic. Mm. It's called Sha'rat al Ma'awiyah, the the hair of Ma'awiyah, or the, or the line, the the thread of Ma'awiyah. He always had a thread between him and his enemy, because at some point the enemy may become a friend, or maybe an enemy he needs the help of. Profound. Now that's enemies. You know, at like. the best, you know. So the, what I'm saying is, you know, these Muslim names. I don't even know any of them. To be honest, I can't remember any Muslim. Because I'm not kind of I don't read much about things I don't really care about too much But Is it not common decency at the level of a believer And nasiha To check in on these people And just check Instead of just checking in on them When you think you de you demand something from them Yeah, 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 yeah So that's unpopular to say But I'm just going to say it Because I, th feel that's, I feel that's prophetic like I'm, I'm saying things because I be believe they're from the prophetic character, and even the analysis I've been presenting, I believe it's from the prophetic. And one of the discourses I he I feel disrespects the Prophet ﷺ is feeling this in this idea that he he wasn't strategic, and he wasn't somebody who thought for a solution, even when the in the midst of battle, because what I got from you during the conversation was, yeah, you know, we can't be talking about this because we're in the midst of battle. The Prophet in the midst of battle was planning out. You know, I'll give you the example of Khandaq cracking the stone and making du'as about the conquests in in Persia, in in in, in the Roman Empire, because he was looking. This means that, and mm. we have to be people that know that this action today means that solution and benefit and victory tomorrow. We have to be those people. Yeah, we have yeah. to insist on being those people. Yeah. Uh, a lot to think about. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Um, I think we will yeah, end it here. Um, and hoping, inshallah, we will continue with this kind of discourse, if you like, trying to understand in the backdrop of Palestine, it's our thought leadership that's in question. Hmm. And more on that, inshallah, in due course. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.